Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm. Today, we've got a really, really cool guest. We're going to get into some software that powers drone companies and the people behind that. So we've got Nick Pilkington. He is the co-founder and CTO of Drone Deploy. He's got a PhD in computer science from Cambridge, X NVIDIA, X Toshiba, founder of Curious Orange, My Money Dog, BitX. His top endorsed skill on his LinkedIn is birthday cake. And he writes a super interesting blog full of technical things that I don't understand. So welcome to the show, Nick. We're very glad to have you. Thanks, Ian. It's great to be here. I'm really excited. Awesome. So I'd like to start it off. Maybe we can get a little bit of an intro, the man behind Drone Deploy, pre-Drone Deploy, actually, uh, or one of the men, rather. So how did you get into software? Like, what was your path to, to, to come to this point today? Yeah, I, I think it goes all the way back to high school. And uh, one of the weekends at high school, I was, I was given this programming book by one of the seniors in my, in my house. And it was on Turbo Pascal, which was pretty popular language at that point. This must have been back in, oh, I guess, 1999. And I remember spending a Sunday in the computer lab trying to understand just a single page of this book and finally got a really basic multiple choice quiz kind of working on the computer. And I was just so excited that kind of built something out of nothing in the same way that you're, you would create a, a painting or you would, you would bake a loaf of bread. It was really kind of exciting to create something. And I, I kind of pursued that. I did a lot of Olympiad programming, um, ended up studying computer science. Olympiad programming, what is that? Yeah, it's kind of like programming competitions. Uh, you try and solve problems in a certain amount of time and then went on to do a bit of coaching after school and coach the upcoming teams in South Africa during the Olympiads. Oh, that's awesome. Did you guys get the gold? We didn't get the gold, actually. We went, we went off to Athens in 2014. Um, I was a member of the South African team. And uh, we did okay. We did okay. One guy in our team did actually get a gold. I, there, di I didn't. Is there an actual torch or is it like a digital programmed torch? Like what's, uh, what's going on here with these uh, <laughs> programming Olympics? I've never heard of this. Yeah, it's called the, the International Olympiad in Informatics. And it's held every year in a different country. And uh, each country around the world sends a team of four software engineers who compete. And they're, they're given about six questions to solve over the course of two days and you're ranked on how many test cases you can solve correctly. Very cool. So do you have a, progr a favorite programming language? Is it Turbo Pascal or has it evolved into something else these days? Yeah, it's definitely evolved into something else. So nowadays, I spend most of my day programming in Python. I think after, after Turbo Pascal, I transitioned to C++. And later on, especially during my PhD and starting the work on drone deploy, I started using a lot of Python and also JavaScript, which is the kind of standard web language that's everything built within the browser uses. Cool. I, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Python is valuable for kind of like database management, or, or maybe you can give like a really quick uh, high level of why Python is, is good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Python is definitely the language we use on most of the backend stuff, definitely at Drone Deploy. And the reason for doing that was, was very pragmatic. Um, we could have built a lot of the software in C++. We could have used some of the other new up and coming languages. But by and large, Python gave us everything that we needed to interact with the databases, to build web services, and also do a bunch of the scientific computing, like the photogrammetry, which we do a lot of. So it was quite an easy choice at that point. We could pick one language that was useful across the back end of the infrastructure. It made it easier to bring on engineers. They didn't need to know three or four different languages. Everything was built in Python on the back end and everything in JavaScript on the front end. Very efficient. So did you find drones or did drones find you? I think it was definitely Mike, my co-founder, who got me into drones, purely from a hobbyist point of view. And this would have been for me back in 2012, 2013, where where autopilots were just emerging, but a lot of the control of drones in the park was definitely manual. And I think that was the, the really exciting inflection point as these drones started carrying cameras and they started flying themselves. And then you had a very exciting piece of hardware that was in the air giving you imagery or giving you video. And it was about kind of taking the next step from there. Mm -hmm. Was it a conscious decision 
to focus drone deploy purely on software or was there kind of a moment where it was thinking about a hybrid company like hardware software i mean what was the what was the the thought process behind getting to where drone deploy is completely a 100 percent software company yeah i think back in 2013 uh, when we started out we were definitely trying to identify the biggest problems in the drone space and there was a lot that was really holding back adoption by companies there were issues with legislation there were issues with the hardware not being in a reliable enough state and there were issues with the software being almost non-existent there was no piece of software that made it easy for people to operate drones mm -hmm. reliably safely and repeatedly and we started with those biggest problems we started with a hardware component in our business that simply connected drones to the internet and that from was the, the co-pilot that right? was the co-pilot okay. yeah it simply provided um a conduit by which we could actually control the drones from a remote location we could get back that imagery and we could start building on top of that and a lot of that kind of functionality is now starting to be incorporated by the drone manufacturers you can see with the more recent DJI drones, they've got much more effective ranges. You can get back that video stream automatically. Um, that hardware didn't necessarily exist for everyone, and that was our motivation for starting to build it. But that started to fade away as more and more of those hardware components became commoditized. Drone Deploy V1.0. How did Drone Deploy evolve from a software perspective from the first version that you guys ever built where you could say, okay, this is drone deploy to where it is now? Well, I think the very first version of it was was pretty dangerous. It would have been <laughs> myself, Jono and Mike uh, holed up in a, a one bedroom apartment with a quadcopter strapped to a table, sending it PWN commands to turn on the motors. And there's a video of that floating around somewhere, but it's pretty much us hiding under duvets as this thing kind of spins <laughs> up and starts to rock the table. Um, maybe that was V0.1. I think V1 was getting data back into the browser. And for us, that was really important because browsers, whether they're on laptops or phones or tablets, that's the interface that everyone is comfortable interacting with things, whether it's email, whether it's applications. That's what people understand. So it was very important for us to build on top of that. So I think the first versions of the software was simply an autopilot sitting on the desk that you could roll, pitch, and yaw and actually see that reflected on an artificial horizon in the browser. And that was really exciting because you're tying these two things together. You're tying together an interface that people understand with this really, really new powerful technology. And was that over LTE networks or Wi-Fi? Or was, were you, are you talking about you were directly plugged in? So that was over LTE. Oh, okay. Yeah. So All that right. was the autopilot sending commands over the LTE network to our infrastructure and us displaying that result in the browser. Not even sending anything back to the drone, just getting that stream of tele telemetry. And how did that evolve? I'm, I mean, I know how it evolved <laughs> for the most part, but I like getting these little tidbits of the thought process because it, it took quite large leaps in very small amounts of time absolutely the, the next step from getting that telemetry was actually sending basic commands to the drone and spinning up the motors changing the flight modes then starting to send more high level functionality like let's send some waypoints let's send a route now let's start triggering the camera and slowly building up functionality to the point that we actually were doing planning in the browser sending those waypoints to the drone having the drone fly and send back imagery. And then we'd kind of close the loop on something that we thought at that point was useful. You can control a drone from your browser and it's not just flight, because the flight in and of itself is fun, but it wasn't really useful in the commercial sense. We actually needed to get something back. And the stuff we got back was a bunch of imagery. Amazing. So for advice for maybe software developers, existing software developers or software engineers, who want to start a drone company. Maybe you can kind of throw some little tidbits out there, some stuff that might have been tough in the beginning, lessons learned, anything you can share on that. Absolutely. I think there, there are two ways to approach this as a drone company. You can kind of take the bottoms up approach where you're enhancing the capabilities of the hardware and you're building better autopilots and you're building drones that can fly further and you're building tighter control loops and better cameras. 
And if you're coming at that from a software engineering point of view, then you really want to master the, the lower level programming languages. You're looking at C and assembly and understanding CAN buses. The other approach is the approach that we took, which is the top down. Start with what people are comfortable interacting with and the tools that people are comfortable using and build downwards towards the hardware. And for us, that was starting in the browser and it was starting with JavaScript and showing people a map where their drone was and what it was doing, and then going towards the back end and Python and down to actually connecting to the aircraft. So I think if you're coming from the bottom up, you're, you're a more canonical controls engineer, you're a mm -hmm. mechanical engineer, you understand systems. Whereas coming from the top down, you're, you're probably a more standard web developer, software mm -hmm. engineer, who's more comfortable with the normal sorts of technologies that you see on the internet today. So like front end. Absolutely, which, okay. is, which is definitely what we look for here. Cool, cool. I'm learning all kinds of stuff every time I talk to you, so this is great. What advice, so okay, we talked about existing software engineers. What about me? What about someone like me who, who really is passionate about the drone industry, tried to dabble in JavaScript once and kind of had a massive failure with a, with a drone flight calculator, but what kind of advice would you give for a fledgling software engineer who is really passionate about drones how do you start learning? What do you need to learn? What kind of languages? We mentioned Python. Is there other languages that you think are very valuable? Yeah, I think JavaScript is a, is a really big one. And, and most of the modern JavaScript toolkits that you see around today, for example, all of our stuff is built in Angular 2, uh, one of the more popular ones. There's also React. Just understanding those sort of frameworks and how these web applications fit together. Because by and large, a lot of the stuff is the same. It's it's an interface that's connecting to some more complicated backend that's providing you with a bunch of information. And that information could be anything. It could be drone imagery, it could be telemetry and flight logs, it could be stitched maps. And having a way to sort of connect to that backend, display that data and interact with that, that's almost always done in JavaScript in the browser. So I think you get the most bang from your buck understanding that because you can start building on top of these existing platforms and build mm -hmm. your own tools that interact with them. Okay, cool. I'll look into that. <laughs> so part 107 was just recently announced. It's big news. What are your thoughts on the current state of the drone industry? There's reports that this rule could generate more than $80 billion for the U.S. economy and create more than 100,000 new jobs over the next 10 years, according to estimates, of course. What are your thoughts on this, on this rule and the current state of the drone industry now that 107 has been announced and moving forward? Now, this is really exciting. Um, obviously, in the United States, we've, we've been a lot further behind on regulation than some other countries. And previously, the 333 exemption process has been quite long-winded and it's been quite expensive. For us, we've always felt that legislation is something that really held back adoption of the drone industry. It was very much a timing risk. I think a lot of people accept that drones are very valuable, very powerful tools that they want to adopt, but regulation is something that was kind of pinching adoption. It was delaying it. Mm -hmm. and we didn't really know when it was going to happen. So part 107 is, is very significant in that sense because we think the floodgates to some extent are going to open now. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier for people to get approval to fly. The process is a lot cheaper. It's a lot lighter. I think we're really going to see a lot of enterprises and larger industries stepping forward where they would have previously been quite high profile legal targets if they had recklessly adopted drones there is now a route for them to do that and i think it's going to be really exciting over the next few months as people start getting getting certified to fly you're actually going to see this adoption really happening on mass absolutely yeah what about south africa are there similar legal challenges or do you keep up with it uh, at all um, over there for, for commercial operations with drones? Yeah, I think South Africa is, is pretty much the Wild West or the Wild South <laughs> <laughs> in terms of drones, which is fantastic. Um, we're, we're definitely a bit further behind in terms, of, in terms of legislation and regulation, but I would hope that starts to happen soon. Um, we're definitely seeing a lot of usage of drones in South Africa, especially with agriculture, um, the beautiful wine farms down in Sel Stellenbosch. So I think like as this technology becomes more proven and people are more comfortable with the ROI and the usage goes up, there's going to be this need for regulation across the world. Definitely. And also there's a lot of anti-poaching initiatives in, in kind of the region, I think. But it's, it seems like it's a lot of a challenge. I think you guys actually had a foray into 
helping out with anti-poaching from maybe a drone deploy version 0 0.3 uh, perspective, but I think it's a really tough challenge to tackle, right? Like there's so much land. Definitely. It's, it's a very close to our heart, the anti-poaching anti and just general conservation initiatives. And the issue was uh, the Kruger National Park, which is a massive game reserve in South Africa. It's about the size of Israel. And the problem there was poachers coming across the border and poaching rhino and elephant for their ivory. And the team is being unable to respond quickly enough to actually prevent this because it was such a large perimeter to monitor. So we wanted to help out with some technology that could automatically monitor those fences so that if you saw poachers encroaching, they could actually dispatch teams to prevent the poaching happening. I still think there's a huge opportunity for that. Um, there are issues with connectivity, but the drones are getting better. The connectivity in the ranges is increasing. So I'm hoping in the not too distant future, we're going to be able to provide some technology that really prevents that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As time goes on, I think the, the connection issues or the connectivity issues around the world will start to really kind of diminish due to work like Project Loon from Google and you know the Facebook internet drone. So that's really cool. That'll be really exciting when when industry, the drone industry, can really make a difference there, along with um, illegal fishing and, and things like that. That's a huge problem. That's so. I mean, there's so much, so much area to cover. You can't really feasibly do it with our current battery technology and these drones. You really need uh, some larger aircraft. So good to know that that you guys are uh, really passionate about that and try to make an impact when we can. Uh, the next question is data security, big data. You know. As these drones do get more endurance, as Part 107 introduces more enterprise companies into our industry, what do you think some of the challenges of managing all of the data are from maybe more of like a software perspective too? Because it's cool to think about it from the enterprise company's perspective. You know, okay, I need my data to be secure and, and safe and whatever the other S is from the Amazon uh, S3. But what do you think are some of the challenges from maybe the drone company's perspective to manage all this data and to ensure security? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard enough to, to build technology for drones. It's, it's hard, even harder to do that at scale and to do that cost effectively and making sure things are secure. It's another kind of dimension to consider. And you're absolutely right. As we start talking to more and more enterprises, the, these questions come up. Where is my data stored? Who has access to my data? Can you guarantee that my data is going to be deleted? Um, is, it in, is it encrypted in, in transit? Is it encrypted at rest? Uh, can you provide an audit log of who has accessed my data? A lot of these things are, are becoming really, really important because this is just how enterprises adopt new pieces of technology. They need those safeguards in place because it's not just necessarily one user who's interacting with the system. It's teams of users with different um, roles and different permissions. And it's really important to understand like how things are being interacted with and how the data is being used. So it's becoming a bigger concern for us. Definitely at Drone Deploy, we're putting a lot more energy into these kind of enterprise features and showing that we've made some good decisions in terms of security and putting the enterprise customers at ease in, in understanding that this is a system that they can trust and that's been, it's been designed and built for this type of scale. Mm -hmm. New software engineers, going back again to someone that might be interested in joining the drone industry, do you see, or, or what is your perspective? I know that you've talked to your fair share and probably someone else's fair share as well of, of you know, prospective uh, employees at Drone Deploy, and it's, you know, very tough as a founder of a startup to get, you know, the right fit. It's not just the skill set, it's also the cultural fit too. But do you think that they view this industry just as anything else? Or what do you see? Do you see some passion behind, you know, for, for these flying robots that, that these people want to take on this new challenge and, and lend their skills um, to a company like Drone Deploy or any other of the drone companies out there that are working with software and, and flying robots? Yeah, engineering wise, I think it's, it's really sexy. <laughs> there are some genuinely difficult problems that we're trying to solve that haven't been solved before. So from an engineering point of view, that's quite enticing. I think a lot of engineers can get frustrated joining a company where they end up just maintaining a system or fixing bugs or maybe incrementally improving something. Mm. 
Mm. Whereas we've got a product roadmap that's stretching out years ahead of us with a bunch of really cool technology that if we can sort of bring it into the platform, that's really, really exciting. And I think that's applicable across the drone space. There are a bunch of these hard challenges. We're really looking for engineers who want to jump in and try and solve these things because totally. there's, there's no pattern for how to do it. So what do you, what kind of characteristics are you guys looking for? Like, we'll take it up to like, so if, if you're trying to get a job right now at a cloud, you know, cloud-based drone company, like what are some of the biggest skills that are needed? I mean, is there something specific? You, you did mention Python, you mentioned JavaScript. Is there anything else that, that really is, is some kind of like hidden benefit that maybe some people don't really know about that you kind of pay attention to? Yeah, I think for us it's really hard because we started out looking to hire this drone engineer persona because they were going to be working on drone technology. But by and large, that person didn't exist yet. Uh, what we ended, ended up having to do is hire full stack engineers or Python and JavaScript engineers and actually train them with the sort of skills that they needed to work on drone technology. And that's been a really rewarding process because by nature of that training, you actually learn a lot more about what you're trying to do and the problems that you're trying to solve. Bonus points for us, um, we do a lot of stuff with imagery, we do a lot of stuff with video, so any experience with GIS systems or mm. uh, photogrammetry is definitely useful. But behind all of that, I guess, is just core algorithmic skills, strong sort of software engineers who know how to approach problems, they know how to break problems down, and know how to communicate those challenges with the rest of a the team. They, they have a big impact here. Cool. That's good to know. So my last question is, in the last three years, the drone industry has progressed by leaps and bounds. What do you see the next three years bringing? That's a good question. That's, that's really exciting. My kind of eyes lighting up with uh, <laughs> excitement at what the future could bring. I think just what we've seen in the last three years has been amazing. On the hardware side, you've seen this, this huge drive towards commoditization. The cameras have gotten better. The drones have gotten cheaper. They've gotten really, really easy to use. They're starting to fly further. And now we're looking at this kind of this next generation of technology that's built on top of that. And I think you're really going to see the use cases for drones going far beyond what we expect them to be used for now. We've always thought that the, the biggest or rather the earliest use cases for drone technology would be in agriculture, construction and mining. But we're constantly surprised every day at seeing the new ways in people are using the same technology platform. And I think we potentially haven't discovered yet what the biggest applications of reliable autonomous technology are. And I think looking forward as we start to do more stuff with video and start interacting more with the physical world and drones and looking at different types of sensors and potentially moving objects around, then you really sort of unlock some really exciting, really disruptive areas of robotics. So machine learning and computer vision, do you think will play a pretty big role in the future of like drone data analytics. Yeah, I mean, machine learning is most effective when you're working with large amounts of data, and that's definitely what's being acquired now. With more and more flights, more and more imagery, more and more of an understanding of what people are trying to do, there's more and more opportunity to learn and to optimize. And that's where machine learning really, really thrives. And we think we're gonna see a lot more of that coming into play, even this year. Cool. Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us. It was it was awesome to pick your brain and get into more of the software and technical backend side of things. If you're interested in keeping up, you can follow Nick on Twitter at Nick P Online or check out his blog that you might or might not understand at Nick P dot S V as in Victor, B as in boy, T L E dot com. Subtle spelled with a V in the middle. Drone Deploy also has a blog that you can read at blog.dronedeploy.com to see what some of the end users in the commercial drone industry are doing. Guys, please rate and review the podcast. It's really important in the beginning. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, follow us on Twitter at Drones Podcast or Facebook at Drones Podcast. Check out our website at commercialdrones.fm. As always, fly safe. Nick, any last parting thoughts before we go ahead and cut off the mics? No, it's been great to be here, Ian, and I think it's really exciting timing for the drone industry. This is definitely a real thing. This is definitely growing very quickly, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Same here, man. Alrighty, everybody, take care. We'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>